I got off pretty lightly there, actually. Um, at FMG, we're really passionate about diversity um, in the agricultural industry um, and the incredible people that drive the industry forward. Um, it's a great privilege to work with many of the industry leaders, including many of you in the room, the rest I can have a chat with later, um, and also including the Ludemans, who I'm about to introduce. Um, it's a real honour to do business with you and also to introduce them to you guys today. Grant and Ali own EGL Pastoral and they're based in North Otago. Uh, Grant bought his first farm when he was only 16. They now have four integrated dairy units on their home farm, milking a total of 2,300 cows with shear milkers. They also have two dairy runoff blocks and five sheep and beef farms from Mid Canterbury to Southland and a sheep and beef farm near Danny Burke. So they've got heaps of spare time on their hands. Grant is passionate about the irrigation, about irrigation and was a director of North Otago Irrigation Company. Ali was a journalist, and like me, it was, is a celebrant, a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust board member and a correspondent for the country radio show, so you'll all be familiar with the tone of her voice. But I'll introduce you to Grant first. Thank you, Abby. I feel something of an imposter talking to deer farmers. We do have some deer, both red and fallow. However, they're all wild. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our journey, the inspiration, what drives us, and makes us what we are. Building a large-scale profitable business takes time, and I want to share with you how we have done this and some of the defining moments along the path. The most important parts of our business are its culture, its people, and its relationships. Ellie says her role in the business is to say yes. We complement each other. I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. I'm the risk taker. She is the creative one. We share a lot. Usually I drive there, she drives home. <laughs> I don't have too many problems working out whether a deal's profitable or not. Well, she thinks there are three types of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> we have a wonderful team of, team of staff, including Don, who came to work for us at the age of 59 after selling our farm at Five Forks in the Wairika Valley and is still doing all our tractor work now at the age of 89. <laughs> Trish, our office manager, has been with us for 20 years and 10 others of our 45 staff have been with us for at least 10 years. We have a, we have a team of eight farm managers four lower order share milkers, and four stock buyers. Our culture is simple. Treat people fairly, pay them well, and treat them as part of the family. We have a weekly newsletter that's emailed to all staff, annual personal development reviews, and flexibility allowing them to try new things as long as it's based on science. Long-term relationships are, are a key ingredient to our success. We've given more than 30 years loyalty to the Alliance Group. We supply stock every day of the season. We are fully paid shareholders and have farms spread from Southland to Danny Verk to give farm assurance, traceability and credibility to our operation. A number of stock agents we deal with have started their careers in North Otago and are still loyal to us after shifting to other parts of the country. The same applies to tra our transport operators, some of who have worked, whom have worked with us for an excess of 30 years. Cooperatives play a large part in our business. FMG, Fonterra, Alliance, Farmlands, Ravensdown and Balance as well as Rubber Bank, and whilst not being a shareholder in the bank, it does fit the principles and cultures that we believe in. Things that make us what we are. I just want to share with you 
a short news video of the Wairika Valley in the mid-1980s. It's a stark reminder of the challenges we faced. Good evening. The South tonight is coming tonight from Napada, a little windblown town just northwest of Omaru. It's one of the areas worst affected by North Otago's long drought. It's been a busy day here at Ian Edmondson's farm. The Minister of Agriculture, Colin Moyle, called first thing this morning to talk with other farming leaders about the drought relief package. And we'll be talking to our own guests later in the programme. But first, a look at the drought itself. The brown tide of destruction, which has cut a swathe through this area, has now spread inland to Mali at Toto and as far south as Palmerston. 600 farmers are struggling for survival. 90% of them are in serious economic dif difficulties. And every day it doesn't rain, their situation gets worse. Here's Cathy Graham. Truckloads of sheep have been shifted from the drought-stricken farms to the works or to the south for grazing. And with them have gone farmers' hopes of a profit. 90% won't be able to make ends meet. Paddocks where spring growth should have supported fat lambs are dry and lifeless. Three quarters of a million animals have gone, more than 50% of all North Otago's capital stock. The few animals that remain are largely left to roam at will, picking at whatever they can find. Those who've hung on to stock this long find prices have dropped out the bottom. We've got farmers now selling lambs as low as $1.50, sheep as low as $1.50. That's equivalent to one loaf of bread. And so the, the position is extremely desperate. As Diaz says, the equivalent of one loaf of bread. I did drive through Timaru the other day and I seen outside Couplands there, they're still selling bread for $1.20 a loaf. So it's amazing how some prices changed uh, in different directions over that period of time, doesn't it? Our rainfall in North Otago is 20 inches or 500 mils, which can vary from 13 inches to 30 inches. In the 70s and 80s, droughts were common, especially dry winters followed by a dry spring and these were the real killers. Combine this with rogenomics, something that had to be done, and farming was not in a great space. Land prices halved, and technically we were bankrupt. But we weren't alone, and there was safety in numbers. We recall interest rates being at the range from 17 to 24%. However, out of adversity comes opportunities, and I was determined that things had to change. Irrigation has played a large part in our lives. First, we drilled, for, drilled and struck artesian water, but quality was poor and there was limited quantity. It was enough, though, for us to convert the first dairy farm on rolling downlands in the Wairika Valley in 1995, and that's our farm in the middle of, of that picture there. The community wanted irrigation, and I joined several others, mainly farmers, to investigate options. This journey took over 15 years, and in the end, the only viable scheme was to pump water from the Waitaki River, initially involving 60 kilometres of underground piping. Politicians, businessmen and other experts said it would never work because of its cost. However, we had one major advantage. Because of numerous droughts, dry land prices were low. So land plus irrigation was still cheaper than the equivalent land in Canterbury and Southland. It was also the start of the dairy boom in 2005. We purchased seven neighbouring dryland farms over a 12-year period and converted them all to dairy or dairy support. The main lessons learned in developing community irrigation schemes are you need passion, skin in the game, and be wary of the shiny-shoed so-called professional directors. The NOIC scheme now irrigates 17,000 hectares with 99.99% reliability and no government assistance. I was fortunate to get a start in farming at the age of 16, but it wasn't until 14 years later, in 1985, I got my lucky break when Fletcher Challenge became the de facto owners 
of the Dunedin Master Butchers Association, or DMBA. They then went on to take over Southland Frozen Meat and Challenge Meats then became a player in the meat industry. The DMBA killed only ewes, and to get a year-round kill, they put out winter contracts. It came with a $2 advance payment and a guaranteed meat price of around 60 cents per kilo. Wrightson's at the time came to me and thought I may sign up 700 ewes. I signed up 7,000, went into central Otago where there was a drought. Shore ewes were $2 each and pre-lamb shore ewes were $4. So I purchased 7,000 pre-lamb shore ewes for $4, got a cheque for $14,000 and we were in business. We grazed them all over the district, mainly on stubble. We ended up shearing the ewes. Pelt prices went sky high and were worth $10 shorn. And so a ewe I had paid $4 for became worth $34. I then discovered I could get buy ewes in the sale yards and make a profit out of them as well. We went on to building a business run predominantly by me supplying 130,000 ewes a year, which was a third of the DMBA's plants throughput. Fletcher's eventually exited the industry at a cost of around $300 million. We survived, and that's how our farm came to be called Challenge Farm. <laughs> I now want to share with you some of the defining moments of our career. In the 80s, we were fortunate to have the services of a sharp young math advisor by the name of Richard Green who encouraged me to go to a course in Wellington called Money and You, run by Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad, Poor Dad fame. We arrived in town here early, and while getting a haircut, the hairdresser said, asked me what I was in town for. I replied, a course called Money and You. She said, it's not one of those courses where you hold hands and sing songs. <laughs> oh, well, you know what I said, there's no way that was ever gonna happen. Well, guess what? <laughs> the first thing we did when we went in was to hold hands and sing John Denver songs. I must say that I was very uncomfortable with it. And uh, it was only two days later on the way home when the team that I was with started talking about all the things we'd been doing in the past two days that I, w that I had a light bulb moment and it has provided us with some of the basic principles of business which we hold close to us to this day. Amongst them was a game of quoits. You got one point for throwing from three feet, 50 points for throwing from 10 feet, and 100 points from throwing from 50 feet. We soon worked out that throwing from three feet was the best way to gain points. This is a principle we apply when looking at opportunities. How many feet are we throwing from? I am a risk taker, but I like to think they're calculated risks. Other principles from the course that guide me are cash is king, don't lay blame or justify, just get on with things, and, this, and the distinction between assets and liabilities. We all know about iron disease, don't we? It also taught us that if we were to make money, we needed leverage, added value, and niche products. In our business today, we finish over 200,000 lambs and 1,500 prime cattle and produce over a million kilos of milk solids. In adding value, we aim to purchase 30 kilos lambs finishing to 40 kilos as quickly as possible. And the niche act aspect of our game is to produce as much of this stock every day of the season, especially through the shoulders and winter. In 2000, I was accepted for the Rabobank EDP course in Australia. It was a wonderful opportunity to share experiences and learn from top farmers from both sides of the Tasman. We'd all face similar problems in growing our business, and we'd all run into the tall poppy syndrome. 
The Aussie farmers just got on and did it. And that has been a major catalyst for the growth in farm purchases in the EGL pastoral group. We also belong to a national farm discussion group called the Pastoral Management Group. They came to visit us 10 years ago when we had speed wobbles and a crisis on two of our dairy operations. As a result of their advice, we put some structure in our business and formed a board of management comprising key management people and our outside accountant. We have 14 financial streams reporting into it, farm policy is debated, and above all else, we have a bank that is very comfortable with it. In everything I do, I've been guided by some important principles. When you do a deal, do it so you'll be welcome back to do another. Always leave something in it for the next person. Earn loyalty from others and repay it with loyalty to them. And show gratitude to the people who help you, especially your great team of employees, your friends and family. This year marks 50 years of farming for me. I've been through droughts and floods, low prices and high, had losses and gains. But the greatest satisfaction is in seeing the Wairika Valley with a landscape like this. Thank you very much. You're probably familiar with the traditional marriage vows. You may not know that they have special meaning for those of us who, take, who choose farmers. When you take on a man of the land, you don't just get the man, but the land and the lifestyle too. To love and to cherish applies not just to your farmer, but to his farm and everything that goes with it. In sickness and in health includes the stock and machinery. For better or worse, takes in the markets and the weather. All of those have a very real bearing of whether it's for richer or poorer. And anyone with dreams of one day retiring to town should take very special note of exactly what's meant by till death us do part. <laughs> we don't have to make vows before we have children. They just turn up. And our first turned up six weeks early. I came home from work as a rural reporter one afternoon and was in Dunedin next morning having an emergency caesarean. Jane weighed only 1.75 kilos, or £3.15 in old money and spend her first two weeks in an incubator. But she's got her father's determination, and by her first birthday, she'd caught up with the Plunkett growth for Graf, at Gr Graf for growth. The day after Jane's birth, I woke up thinking, if this is babies, one's enough. Such memories fade, and a couple of years later, we had our second. Tom's story is a long one of a short life. He had a degenerative brain disorder. Grant told you about the bonus we got from sharing during the ag sag. He didn't say that that meant that we were sharing every couple of weeks and I was feeding the sharers. My memories of that, that winter are of being in hospital with Tom or at home either feeding the sharers or getting the food ready for someone else to feed them when Tom and I were back down in Dunedin. We still didn't have a diagnosis by August but Tom's doctor gave his prognosis. Tom was likely to die soon, or if he lived, he'd be severely handicapped. I didn't know which would be worse. I didn't want him to die, but the thought of life with a severely handicapped child with multiple disabilities was no better. We don't have a choice about things like this, and a month later, when he was just 20 weeks old, Tom died. 
A lot of people said that was better, and I understand what they meant, but I also wondered if this was better, how bad would worse be? We had wonderful support from our family and friends, but I still felt constantly tired, kept getting colds and minor illnesses, and also got angry about things I'd normally taken my stride. I was beginning to wonder if I was going to spend the rest of my life bobbing round in the sea of grief, when I went to a Women in Agriculture Day on the theme of Beyond Aspirin for Feelings that are a Pain in the Neck. I'd kept saying I didn't blame anyone for Tom's death, and I didn't. I was quite sure that we'd both had the best possible care from the start of my pregnancy. However, what I learned that day helped me realise that in spite of that, I was still angry that the baby we'd wanted and loved had died. Being able to name, claim and tame that feeling gave me the breakthrough I needed. Tom's post-mortem found no more answers than the extensive tests he'd had throughout his life. But they did rule out all the known genetic conditions. We saw a genetic specialist who told us, barring the one in a million chance Tom had something medical science hadn't caught up with, it'd be quite safe to have another baby. So, just over two years after Tom's birth, exactly 30 years today, we welcomed the arrival of our second son, Dan. Jane wasn't happy. She was four by then, and she thought that sisters died. Uh, sorry, she wanted a sister because she thought brothers died. The rest of us were delighted for a couple of weeks, and then Dan had a convulsion. I'd watched Tom have hundreds of fits, so I was in no doubt about what, we, what I was seeing. We called our GP, who sent us back down to Dunedin, where Dan underwent the tests and procedures that were so horribly familiar. It had taken me quite a while to work out how I felt about Tom. It didn't take me any time at all to know what I was feeling about Dan. I was absolutely furious. When I had a shower that first night in hospital, I stood there with the water pouring over me, and I screamed and I cried and I swore. At first, there was hope that Dan might have something that could be treated. But as test after test came back negative, we had to face up to the knowledge that he had the same condition that had killed his brother. So we took him home and we waited for him to die too. Several times he nearly did, but each time he pulled through. And when he turned one, we were facing up to the knowledge of how life might be if he lived. Jane would have the disadvantages of having a brother and being an only child because Dan would demand our time, energy and attention and yet never be able to share the normal sibling experiences. For Grant, there'd be something that maybe only farmers really understand. He knew in his head he, that Jane might be a farmer and he could have any number of sons who wouldn't want to be. But in his heart, there was still the sadness that he wasn't going to be able to do the sort of things with his son that his own father had done with him. And for me, there was the knowledge that it would get increasingly more difficult to care for Dan as he continued to grow physically without developing intellectually. But parenthood, at least as much as marriage, is for better and for worse, in sickness and in health. You can't give a baby back because he's not the happy, healthy one you wanted, nor do you stop loving him just because his brain doesn't work properly. And when faced with a situation like this, you don't have a lot of choice. You cope or you don't. Having chosen to cope didn't mean I always did it well. But again, we had that great support from family and friends, and later from IHC that provided shared care, paying another family to look after Dan to give us a break. As Dan approached his fifth birthday, we looked at other options and enrolled him at North School in Omaru that had a unit for disabled children. We gave him a backpack for his birthday, not for the books, pencils, artworks and toys that other kids tote to and from school, but to hold the feeders, napkins, change of clothes, medicine, instructions, and instructions that had to accompany Dan everywhere. He never got to use it. Just 10 days after his birthday, he died. A lot of people said that was better, and I agreed. Our lives better both because he died, but more because he lived. Dan's death freed us up to do many of the things we couldn't with him. Simple things like swimming in the river or walking on the beach. 
but it's only because he lived that we don't take those for granted. In the 20 short weeks of Tom's life and the aftermath of his death, we learn to truly appreciate the support of a close and loving family and circle of friends. Dan reinforced the lessons his brother gave us and added to them. We used to look at him and say he couldn't do anything, but he taught us to lose the fear and ignorance we had about intellectual disability, to accept that people are people regardless of what they can or can't do. Through him, we learned to appreciate the little pleasures in day-to-day -day life that he couldn't experience. And most of all, he taught us that ability isn't a right, it's a privilege. And the door that closed with Dan's life and death opened another for us. The local AFS chapter approached us to see if we'd host an exchange student for a year. We said yes, and the following January, a young Argentinian, Bruno Rossi, arrived. He'd studied English at school, but it wasn't a lot of use. When he came to us, he could say, please, thank you, rugby, all black. <laughs> the important words. He soon learned English, though. Uh, there's a huge element of luck in these relationships. We got the jackpot. Bruno's family is now our family. They've all visited us, and we've had 11, 11 trips to see them. You have a lot of long days when your children are young, but they're short years. And before we knew it, Jane was, had left home to do a BSc at Otago, followed by an optometry degree in Auckland. I left too, although only part-time and temporarily. I went down to Dunedin to do a writing course. It was only in the, in the mornings, and so, because of our Argentinian connections, I picked up Spanish at university in the afternoons. The writing finished in July, but I didn't know enough Spanish and found out that if I did another two and a half years, I could get a diploma for graduates. I negotiated some extra leave from home and had just started my third year when Grant had a tractor accident and nearly killed himself. Always have a cab, always use your seatbelt. I had to pull out of Varsity to look after him. When he was getting better, he said, since I couldn't learn Spanish, we could go and live it. We consulted Professor Google, found a language school in Vejia de la Frontera in Andalusia, found a house to rent, and spent three sunny months in southwest Spain. Grant returned to full house, and mi español mejorado mucho. The growing business has provided quite a lot of opportunities for travel. And we were in Auckland on our way to a Rabobank Executive De Development alumni event in Australia two years ago when, he got a, when we got a text from Jane saying she was on her way to hospital with in intense abdominal pains. That was the start of another long story. The short version of which is that she was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 32. Low-grade serous ovarian cancer. It's a rare subtype which is usually incurable and her doctor has given her five to 15 years. When people learn about Tom, Dan and Jane, a lot say they couldn't cope. But it would only compound the tragedy if being bitter and twisted and focused on what we've lost blinded us to what we still have. I won't pretend that's easy. There have been a lot of tears, a lot of prayers, and quite a few swears. And I'm pleased my mother doesn't know that. <laughs> but once more, we've had that terrific support from family and friends. We've been to a counsellor. I do laughter yoga, and yes, that is a thing. And we've got Jane's example to inspire us. It would have been easy for her to sink into depression and stay there. She could have chosen to focus only on herself. Instead, she's chosen to do much more. To fight, not just for herself, but for all the other women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer, almost half of whom are, like her, in their 20s and 30s. What will determine whether these women live or die is the rate of research, and there simply isn't enough yet. Low-grade serous ovarian can cancer counts for 3 to 8% of all ovarian cancers, but receives less than 1% of the research. The limiting factor is funding. 
So Jane's created an alternative funding resource. She founded Cure Our Ovarian Cancer, a chari charity that facilitates donations for research on low-grade serous cancer. She built a website, got stories from women with the disease all over the world, and approached ch charities funding existing researchers and asked them to create a pathway for donations that would go solely to this disease. We cashed in our disaster fund and gave it to MD Anderson Cancer Centre in Houston for a major research project, and will to continue to give what we can. And Jane's using the website to create awareness and raise funds for more research. If you're looking for a charity to support, please do consider this one, Cure Our Ovarian Cancer. Not just for Jane, but for all the other women with the disease. Your help could truly make a difference. Please also go to the website and share the symptoms. Ovarian cancer affects one in 70 women and is the fifth most common cause of female cancer death. More women die of it than melanoma, yet like too many others, until Jane was diagnosed, we knew almost nothing about it. I gave a card with these symptoms to a man the other day. He read it and he thought he might have it. <laughs> That's part of the problem. The symptoms are vague. So please tell all the women you know to check them. And if they last for more than a couple of weeks, go to a doctor and keep going until you find out what's causing them. I've taken you through a lot of dark clouds. Let's get back into the sunshine. Nine months after her diagnosis, Jane's partner, Joe, proposed. They were married last year, and he's joined our business. His official title is Assets and Compliance Manager. That covers multiple roles, not least of which is dragging us into the 21st century with technology, and we've got Joe to think that both Grant and I had this PowerPoint. In fairy tales, many people marry and live ha happily ever after. Reality isn't so simple. In business and family life, there are always challenges. I'm grateful that after the rain, there's also been rainbows. That's the view from our kitchen window, and I have to keep focusing on that. We've had our challenges, but there's also been a lot of love. Grant finished with the principles that guide him. I'm going to finish with Robert Fulgham's Storyteller's Creed that guides me. I believe that imagination is stronger than knowledge, that myth is more potent than history, that dreams are more powerful than facts, that hope always triumphs over experience, that laughter is the only cure for grief, and I believe that love is stronger than death. <laughs>